subscribe to this podcast to get exclusive access to the after show shooting liveries welcome to cool explorations i'm your host tony peters today we're going to be talking to amadeus long who uh is going to tell his testimony about how god took him from a a life of drugs and living for whatever he wanted to live for to living for god and cleaning up his life and repairing relationships Mm -hmm. that he had damaged Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cool Explorations. I'm your host, Tony Peters. Today, we have Amadeus Long with us, and uh, I've been looking forward to hearing his testimony. So why don't you tell us a little bit who you are and what you're currently doing? Um, My name is Amadeus. Um, I'm 33, and right now I'm just currently relaxing after work, actually. Um, So, yeah, um, I'm a manager at Flying Ace Car Wash. so yeah, currently I just work and you know just be a dad and that's pretty much it. The grind. <laughs> yes, it's, it's it's a tough grind. It is a tough grind. So you have a very interesting testimony uh that uh I've heard alluded to before by uh other people. So I'd like to hear your testimony uh and what God is uh currently doing in your life. Okay, sure. Um, it's kind of, I'm going to give you a quick backstory to how it all began in the first place. Um, my name is Amadeus. Uh, that name actually means love of God. Um, when I first found out that my name meant that, it sent me into a um, spiral of chaos, you could say, because it made me want to look for my father um i was raised in a single parent home so when i found out that's what my name meant i wanted to find that love that you know of god that my name meant and i thought that i should have found that in my father um so i spent years looking for my father uh to later find out that he is um, serving a prison sentence of 30 years. So um, once I found that out and I started learning and growing, um, I tried to reach out to him at times. He reached out. We wrote letters and, and talked and stuff. Um, but unconsciously, I was still searching for him to, you know, waiting for him and that kind of caused me to kind of be like him in a certain sense. So um, 2010, I ended up having a son. um, And also in 2010 was when I first got in trouble um, with the law. And um, I ended up doing about, I want to say, four and a half months in prison. And um, it's just funny because I, I used the uh, the excuse to the judge when I got in trouble. You know, I was like, hey, I'm a new father. You got to you gotta let me out of this place. <laughs> got to be a father to my son. So, um, you know, at the time it, it worked. But uh, fortunately, I did still a little bit of time, about four months. So um, I'm going to fast forward to... 2016, six years later. Um, <clears throat> mind you, I had one year left before I could move on from the thing I got in trouble from because it takes seven years to clear off your record. So, um, so yeah, I got one year left and <laughs> I'm doing what I was doing before that got me in trouble, but a lot more this time. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I never really stopped doing anything. Um, so for some reason, like God was speaking to me before then, and I didn't even know it. So um, the I was into drugs. So the drugs I was into, um, somehow I started feeling like, I guess you can say sentimental or I start feeling like this love come over me and other people. So um, I started worrying about the people I was, you know, messing with drugs with. And in that trade, you you can't, you're not allowed to do that. It's either 
<laughs> get the money and don't care because you can't do both, you know. So um, I was trying to do both. And I don't even know where that came from, you know, that just kind of happened. So I was worrying about the people who were doing the drugs. I was, you know, trying to help them and keep them safe off the streets and stuff like that. And um, so I ended up getting in trouble um, with the police. So I got sentenced to six years in prison for that. Um, so this is kind of where my testimony starts. Um, so I'm feeling this emotion and compassion on people out of nowhere. Um, so I'm sitting in the county jail and I'm trying to figure out, you know, what my next move is. And, um, all of a sudden it's like brokenness comes over me. You know that, I know you felt it before, uh, Tony, it's like where you're hurting so bad, like you can feel it in your throat yeah. and like, like your, your heart and chest is hurting. Um, but this pain I'm talking about was so intense. Like it just rained over me for like two days when it first started. And, um, so yeah, I'm I'm sitting there, I'm in pain, man. And one day, uh, I think it was like the next day, I get up before everybody gets up and um I've up until this point, I know that I don't recall any kind of like Bible scripture reading. I remember going to church and stuff like that. Um but I don't remember anything that the pastor was saying. Um I don't remember anything before that that had anything to do with God. So, like I said, one morning I got up and um, I was sitting down in the the day room by myself. And um, believe it or not, I hear a voice, a voice, calm voice speaks to me. And I'm looking around like, okay, (laughs) you know, what's going on? Like, I'm I'm going crazy. So, (laughs) um, so. I had actually already been in the county jail for some weeks now because I don't have enough money to bond out. So I'm in there. I'm sober. Um, yeah, I'm looking around like I hear this. I hear this voice, and you know, I kind of sit back in my chair and ignore it. And then I hear my name being called once again. You know, saying Amadeus. I'm just like, so I play the game. You know, I'm like who's there? Am I hearing stuff? Like, you know, I don't, I don't really know how to react to something like that. So I guess in a way I just entertained it. I'm like, who is it? (laughs) Like I answered the phone or something. And, um, as soon as, you know, the voice starts speaking again, like I, that's when I knew it was God. Like nothing had to tell me it was God. He didn't even say he was, or anything like that, but something just came over me and it, I just knew it was God. And, um, he just kept saying my name. And then he said, I'm a dash here in pain. My son, he called me his son. Um, he said that he could heal me. And I said, you could heal me. I was like, well, how do I know this is really God? And, um, he said, listen, you're in pain. You may not trust me, but this is your only way out. And I'm thinking in my head, okay, so now it's getting serious, <laughs> you know. So um, I said, okay, you can heal me, God. What can you heal me from? Like, he's like, well, I can feel that you're in pain. Um, and you fear that you're going to do to your son what your father did to you. And that is going to prison for 30 years, you know. So my father actually got out of prison maybe two and a half, three years ago, and I'm 33 now. So, um, yeah, he did. He's gone for a while. Um, So, yeah, I'm like, okay, so what do I have to do to fix this broken pain in my heart? Um, What do I have to do? He said, well, all you have to do is love me first. And I said, okay, that's it. And he's like, yeah, but you have to love me more than you love your son. 
And um, I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I can't do that. I was like, that's that's why I'm doing all this in the first place. You know, I want to be there for my son. He said, yeah, but I was being there according to how I wanted to be there and not according to how I was supposed to be there for my son. And um, and I said, well, I can't do that. I I made him, me and my girlfriend, we made him. And instantly he's, no, you didn't make him. I made him is what God told me. And I'm just like, and I'm, and he's just hitting me with these curveballs. I'm like, oh man, like, yeah, you, like that is right. Like yeah. when he said that, I couldn't help but feel like, it's like, you're right. You made me because at the time I believed in God, but I didn't know who he was. Um, So I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, you're right. <laughs> and, um, so he said, listen, Amadeus, if you love me first, not only, and he added to what he said at first, he said, not only will I break, I mean, heal your pain, I will also put you back into his life and show you how to be a real father. And like, I will never forget those two things, that he would fix my brokenness and put me back into his life. And um, he said, all you have to do is love me first. Um. So I thought about it for a quick moment and um, I went up to my bunk, laid down and, um, you know, I kind of felt like, okay, this is, this has to be something real, you know? So it was at that time that I accepted it. I'm like, okay, this is real. This happened. Like I have to change. And I went to sleep. And when I woke up, it was like, it's hard to even explain the difference that came over me. Um, my pain was gone. It was almost like I could see, hear, smell, and touch all different all of a sudden. Like, it was like my eyes were open, like this, like scales fell off my eyes. Like, I know that happened to Paul, but like, that's kind of what it was like. And now everything was different. Um, I instantly picked up the Bible and I read it and it just, it spoke to me right off the, right off the bat. And I'm just like, what the heck? And within literally weeks, I'm having like sermons in the back of um, my cell <laughs> and like guys are actually coming to it and listening to me. And I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm just telling them like, man, this stuff is crazy. Like I was, you know, I've been saved or whatever. And um, I haven't looked back since, man. Um, and so just a little, another backstory. So I got caught with a lot of different kind of drugs, like pills, um, heroin, crack cocaine, um, some guns and stuff like that. And uh, I was looking at doing a lot of time. So, um I worked my butt off. I ended up bonding out. Um, I got a lawyer. He reduced my bond. I got out. Worked my butt off when I got out. And, and yeah, man, when they finally sentenced me, I thought that I was going to be gone for a long time, but they gave me six years, you know, and that's when I knew that I beat my case. Even though I still had to go to prison, I beat my case. And, um, you know, I can go into even more detail, like, God was with me the whole entire time. I, it's like I never went to prison. It reminds me of Joseph when his brothers sold him um, into slavery. Um, so when I went to prison, my number one fear was, you know, just being by myself, being alone, um, not having any money or whatever. So I ended up going to a prison called Edinburgh. It's actually in down south of Indiana. Um, as soon as I get there, <laughs> people are smoking. Like, you can buy cigarettes and stuff there. And I'm just like, what kind of prison is this? Like, they're allowed to smoke and buy cigarettes? Like, I was confused. And I went into the game room. And usually you might see, like, a pool table or something. Man, they had TVs mounted up on the wall with Xboxes and 
PlayStation 4s. I'm just like, where am I? Like, <laughs> and come to find out, uh, I went to an army base. It was a correctional facility on army base. And, um, man, I wasn't feeling it. It wasn't where I was wanting to go. Since I was going to do six years, I'm like, well, see me closer to my house. I want to go to Newcastle. And they end up sending me almost three hours away from home. So I'm doing whatever I can to get sent home, closer to home. And I'm making up lies. Oh, geez, this smoking is killing me. I got headaches every day. And, <laughs> you know, I'm I'm ready to go. So um, my counselor comes to me one day, like maybe about a month or so after I've been there. Freshly new inmate in prison. And they're like, hey, we got transfer orders for you. Are you sure you want to go? I'm like, yes, I want to go. It's like, well, you have to come down here and sign these papers. So I'll get up out of my bunk and I'm walking downstairs and I'm, you know, walking or whatever. And on the wall is a wall, a uh, flyer that says prison fellowship. And I stop and I look back at it. And <laughs> Prison Fellowship is a program for um, it's a scripture based program for inmates to take to help develop them and, you know, give them skills to to go back out into the world. So I passed that and I'm like, what the heck? And on the bottom, it says not a time cut. Now, there's programs that you can take that will give you a time cut. This was a year long program that you have to commit to. And it was not a time cut. So I would do a year just for a year in return. And when I passed it, God spoke to me again. He said, sign up. I'm like, what? Like, I want to go home. <laughs> like, let me yeah. go home. <laughs> and, um, you know, I ended up signing up and, man, did that program. And in the midst of that program, man, FYI, Inmates make, I want to say, 25 cents an hour in prison, and they get paid by the month. Um, within eight months of me being there, I had got moved to an honor dorm for good behavior, and then I got a job working third shift for the Indiana Pacers, And um, which I love basketball. I don't know if anybody doesn't know. They know I love basketball. So... I'm working third shift and I'm making minimum wage. So me and a handful of guys are the only people in the whole entire facility that are making minimum wage, working 10 to 12 hour days, almost every night at an NBA basketball court. And we set up for countless concerts, saw Post Malone, Justin Timberlake, countless NBA players. and during that process, I ended up getting more time cuts, and that was my prison sentence. And there would be times my son would call me, and he would say, Dad, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm sitting here eating a box of pizza. He's like, you order some pizza? I said, yeah. He's like, how'd you order some pizza? I'm like, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I was able to order the pizza because, you know, they things like that for the inmates who were doing good or whatever. He's like, Dad, are you really in prison? I said, yes, <laughs> I'm in prison. But, um, yeah, man, uh, I feel like I'm kind of talking a lot. But, um, but yeah, yeah, man, just I tell people that I got that prison uh, ministry. You know, that's what came to me. And uh, I just know I'm blessed with it because I see a lot of people go through that. And, um you know, I'm not the one to judge anyone or whatever, but a lot of times they do it just to get out sooner or whatever. Yeah. But it was it was real for me. You know, um, I ended up getting baptized, baptized in prison 2018, uh, September uh, 4th. And um, yeah, man, it, it was real for me. I gave I gave God the, the keys to my house, <laughs> you know, my temple. And, uh, man, it's just my life has not been the same ever since. 
Yeah, um, and it's it's really cool to see how God kind of guided that whole process and really put you where he wanted you to be and where you needed right. to be. Right. Um, and so we're going to do kind of a compare and contrast here. So before you came to Christ, what did your life feel like to you? Man, <laughs> that's easy. Um, I felt alone. I felt like I had no control in my life. Um, I felt like I had, um, that I was just addicted to trying to live. Like I was doing whatever I could to survive. And um, it was just like, almost like I was just ignorant or something like, it was, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's, I wasn't me, you know, I, I felt like I was somebody else. I was trying to be somebody else. Um, and you said, what's it compared to what it's like now? Yeah. What's it like afterwards, after you came to Christ? So, so now, man, it's, um, I just posted on my Facebook today by letting God take over. I now have the power to take over everything in my life now. It's, I know it's weird to say it like that, but like by letting God take control of my life, I now can take control of my life. So mm -hmm. I'm no longer afraid. There's nothing that I fear anymore. Like there's nothing that I fear. I've, God showed me that there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, oh, and with that being said, you know, God introduced me to Jesus, you know, like, I started learning about Jesus. I'm like, cause I never knew what it meant, what God meant, what Jesus meant. I never knew, like I always thought they were two different people and I had never understood that. And he introduced me to Jesus. And I'm just like, wow, this is your son. Like, <laughs> and that changed the game too. Like that's when I knew I was saved. When I got baptized, I got baptized in the Holy spirit and I knew I was saved. So, so now man, it's just like, I have control and I can always feel myself when I want to do something like I'm not supposed to do or something. And I can just be like, nah, sit down. You know, it's like the old me, you know, I tied him up and put him in the basement, but sometimes, you know, he breaks his, his, his wraps and comes up and knocks on the basement door. And I'm just yeah. like, nah, man, you got to sit back down and let me tie you up again. And, uh, you know, he tries his hardest to get out, but, I tell people like, man, I'm going on almost five years clean, haven't smoked. Um, I don't get drunk or anything like that. And man, out of all the times I've ever used any drug, I have been higher off God than anything. And I just like, it's like a peace beyond understanding type of thing. And I always like to say like, there is no high like the most high. And um yeah, man, it's, it's really hard to explain how God has changed my life. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of like uh, that feeling I, I had in my life for many years. Was, it was like it was a, a void I was trying to fill, and nothing could fill it. No matter what I did, I couldn't fill it. And uh, when I came to realize that only God could fill that void, it definitely was like chains being broken. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I think it's incredible um, the story that uh, goes into into what your your testimony is, and it, it kind of reminds me of the Bible study that we just did this past this uh, past mm -hmm. week here with the with the rich man having to have to yeah. give up having yeah. to actually be willing to give up his riches and and everything to to follow Christ, right. and and once you've done that, it definitely does it changes you, right. And that's um that's exactly what it's like. Um my son was my number one love. Like I would back then I would do anything for him. I would die for him back then. And now that I took that out and replaced it with God, like everything below that is like a domino effect. Everything fell. And now like it enabled me to see. So 
Like sometimes when I'm preaching to people, I tell them, man, it's about where your heart is. Like, where's your treasure at? Like, what do you care about so much? You know, and um, like I said, studying the scripture helps you understand this because all these things are temporary. Like even my son is temporary, you know, so I have to trust God. And because if I lose my son one day, if that is where my heart is, then I'm going to lose myself. You know, and I cannot do that because I almost lost my whole entire life because of that already. So now I can just look and be like, OK. But the crazy part is, though, is now for somehow, some way, I'm able to love him more than I did before. You know, so it's like I'm not going to die for him. I'm going to live for him because he needs me there, you know, so. Like Father God told me, he said he's going to put me back in my life, put me back in his life and teach me how to be a real father. And that's kind of ironic how the father of the universe <laughs> is teaching me how to be a father and everything is literally falling into place for me. And there's no so, better teacher. <laughs> mm, no better teacher. Amen. So I know uh, single parenthood is something that is a major problem. Uh, in our society across all cultures, um, especially in North America and uh, many places in Europe um, and across Africa, uh, we see this this single parent phenomenon. What um, <clears throat> would you say would be the best way for us to to combat this single parent problem uh, that we see in society? Mm, um. You know, well, first off, I won't ever claim to have all the answers. Um, it's just my opinion, my suggestion. But, um, you know, for a single parent, for for the parent, um, just realize that it's okay that you can't do everything that you may want to do for your child. Um, nowadays, I see a lot of parents that are pretty much doing anything and everything that they can. Um, me as a parent, I did that. You know, I like most people will say, oh, I'll kill for my son or my daughter. Yeah, you're doing nothing but setting up a trap for yourself. Because the moment someone says something to your parent, your child and you kill someone for your child, you still lose your child. You know, and um, that is the most important thing. And you have to be humble. You know, I grew up, man, eating fish sticks and <laughs> macaroni, you know, macaroni and cheese every night. And, you know, I was fortunate for that. You know, there's a lot of kids that didn't even have that. But, um, you know, my mom didn't do anything extra for us. And um, and to for the children, um, like I said, I even as a child, I looked for my father. I looked for a love. Um, even that, that started in second grade, by the way, um, when I started looking for my father. So I, even at second grade, I knew that there was a love that I was searching for. So um, I believe that all children are searching for that love. And um, it's up to us as parents to just show them that love, not that love that you will die for them, but that love that we will live for them. We will show them that, you know, a little bit of hard work goes a long way. Show them that it's not going to take a get rich quick scheme or anything like that. Like some things are just meant to be taken slow and that's one of them. Yeah. And okay. that, I think uh, a key part of that is, is the the faith component. Um, and, and a lot of parents that are single that they don't, they don't have a faith that they're really standing on. And I think for those parents who are going through it, uh, faith for my dad, especially, I know um, when he was raising us alone uh, for for those few years, he, he really struggled. And when he found faith, it really helped. It really helped him. And then God brought another woman into his life who uh, really became a mother figure for us. Uh, and uh, so I think that, through faith, God, he will bring those blessings and he will help you get through these, these right. 
tough times. Um, right. And what, as a church community, do you think we we could do better to support single parents? Just be there. You know, I see a lot of uh, judging and I see a lot of people who they hold things against another person. Um, and that's what the system is all about. You know, um, you see it all over the time. Somebody does something, they're, they're held accountable to what they did before. And um, we just got to stop doing that, man. Um, I know people make mistakes. People make horrible mistakes. I, I do understand that. Um, but I think as a church community, we need to find a way to still love them through those mistakes and and show them that it's okay because that's what healed me. You know, I couldn't understand why God – chose to forgive me and heal me i was sinning you know i'm doing all kinds of stuff you know what i mean and and god still healed me he still took my pain away he still told me that he loved me um he was there for me and it starts with you just knowing that you can't be forgiven for some reason people think that they can't be forgiven They've done so much stuff, and they're like, oh, well, I've done it. It's too late. I might as well keep doing it. Nah, it's, it's never too late. Oh, and I want to say that, too. Like, growing up, I always thought that I never had an option. Like, sometimes if you are late on a bill, as a parent, like, oh, I don't have an option. I have to go do this to pay this light bill. You, ha you always have an option. You know, it may not be what you're wanting, but it's an option, you know. Um, yeah, the light may be turned off, but you never know how God's going to work in that. You know, we don't try to do good by doing wrong. Like, that's the one thing that just, it doesn't work. I can't be a good person by doing wrong. You know, I'm, I know the scripture says there's no one good, but it's just, you can't, you can't fix your life doing wrong things, man. Like it's, you're going to hit a trap sooner or later. So, you know, uh, uh, the Bible tells us to don't grow weary while doing good, you know? And, um, like you said, man, it's about that faith and that trust. So. Yeah. And I think the love and compassion mm -hmm. that, that you mentioned is, is something that we definitely need as a society these days, um, as a church, right. Um, and people aren't used to seeing love and compassion anymore. Uh, they're used mm. to seeing hate at every corner. Right. And so when they see love and compassion, they can see that there's something different. There, there, right. there's something that that's changed, uh, about a person and, uh, they'll be attracted to that because it's something they're not used to. It's something refreshing. So I think that's right. a very, very important point that, that you brought up there. Right. And, man, unfortunately, love is <laughs> is so tainted. You know, I, I can't be nice to a man or a woman without them thinking I'm trying to do something to them. <laughs> you know, like, well, why are you being so nice to me? I'm just like, man, it's it's because I love you, man. How You don't know me. How, how do you love me? And I'm just like, listen, you can take what I'm trying to give you. I will leave you alone forever. But it's just out of kindness in my heart, man. And like I, like you said, it, it just starts with that. You know, none of us are perfect. Um, we shouldn't strive to be perfect. We shouldn't strive to be saving, trying to save one another. We should strive to love one another. And um, in these times of of in these times that we're going through, so yeah, yeah, no, that's very very true. Uh, so thanks, Amadeus, for coming and sharing today. I've been looking forward to your testimony. Uh, so it, it's great that uh, that we can have this conversation today. Uh, is there any final thoughts you'd like to leave us off with before we uh, sign off? <clears throat> um, thanks for having me. Um, this is kind of fun. Um, nah, no thoughts, man. Uh, just thanks for having me. God bless you, man. Um, I know you go through a lot. God bless you and your family. Um, yeah, bring me back next time. Will do. 
Thank you for listening to Cool Explorations. You've just been listening to Amadeus Long. Now this testimony about how God took him from a life of living for drugs and for whatever he wanted to live for to a life where God redirected him and really helped shape him into a better human being. If you would like to reach me for any reason, you can do so at tpeters745 at gmail.com. Well, I have just been uh, blessed with so many people who are requesting to be on the show, and I'm impressed with how many people want to share their testimonies or what they're doing uh, for the Lord right now. Uh, if I haven't got back to you, I promise I will get back to you. Uh, I look forward to, to speaking with each of you and interviewing you. And uh, keep tuning into the show. There, there's lots of, of new people that are coming on here, and if you're considering wanting to to come on the show uh just shoot me an email at tpeters745 at gmail.com and uh, i will get back to you